So hi all, um, I am David Freeman Ingstrom. I'm a professor at Stanford Law School uh, and I work on AI, AI issues there wearing a couple of different hats. Uh, first off, I'm currently leading a project that includes NYU Law's own Kathy Sharkey and we're advising the Administrative Conference of the United States on AI use within federal agencies. Mm. Uh, in addition, I'm currently serving as an associate dean and I've been tasked with a very small uh, uh, question of what the law school should be doing over the next 10 years in the law and tech space. Mm -hmm. So given my double role, I'm really grateful to have been a part of such a terrific gathering and uh, in particular to get to lead such a talented and thoughtful panel. So the topic for our session is the role of government. And we have a panel that I think we can all agree is an all-star cross-section of different professional roles, experiences, and perspectives. And so let me introduce them. And then I wanna say a couple more words before we launch with, uh, with the panel proper. So uh, first off, immediately to my left, we have Eileen Locke, who was until somewhat recently the general counsel of the IEEE. Uh, she is now still at the IEEE and is one of the leaders of the Global Initiative on Ethics of, of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. And so I'm sure she will tell you more about the work she's doing in that capacity. Uh, to her left is Michael Fitzpatrick. He is currently head of regulatory advocacy at GE. But prior to that, he did hard time in the government. He was previously associate administrator of OIRA within OMB, so very important role within our government if you know something about administrative law. Mm. Moving down the row, we have Kay Koizumi. He is currently a visiting scholar at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, but before that, he was also in government. Uh, he was the Assistant Director for Federal Research and Development and Senior Advisor to the Director uh, of the National Science and Technology Council at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Finally, last but not least, we have Brittany Saunders. Uh, she is our esteemed keynote, so you will hear from her both on this panel, but also to close out the entire conference. Uh, she is currently co-chair of the New York City Automated Decision Systems Task Force. Uh, but she also has a day job. Uh, she is a deputy commissioner for strategic initiatives at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, which is the city's main anti-discrimination agency. So the format that we decided on as a, as a group was to leverage a wide range of perspectives by having each panelist give what we could call an opening statement that won't last for more than five minutes, I hope. <laughs> um, and they're going to tell us who they are and at a broad level how they think about this topic of the, of the government role within the AI space. And, and then we can dive into some particular issues and hopefully leave plenty of time for, for Q&A. Before we get there, though, I want to start with just a couple of broad orienting remarks. And I want to briefly sketch two ideas. Um, so the first idea is that the topic for this session, the role of government, is a huge and frankly ungovernable topic. Hmm. And there's a couple of ways this is so. First, the topic touches on at least three very different types of government action. Okay, so we will talk a little bit about government regulation of AI out in the world. So AI as deployed within the private sector. We'll also talk a bit about government promotion of AI through funding and research. And we'll also talk about government use of AI tools and techniques. So by its own administrative agencies to perform the work of governance. So that's one way in which we have a, a sprawling topic here, but worse, the role of government spans many policy areas. It isn't domain limited. And even if we exclude the criminal justice context, the topic of the, well, mostly the topic of the, of the previous panel and, and the Mott trial yesterday on the Loomis case, even if we exclude that context and focus on civil regulatory matters, we've heard during this conference and everyone's read that AI is gonna transform the workplace, healthcare, transportation, commercial practices, including the way companies identify target and segment cost customers, banking, law practice, and this is just a partial list. And the challenge for us is that each of these policy areas has its own structure, its own logic, and its own imperatives. 
So in other words, we kind of have a sprawling mess on our hands. The good news is that some of the ideas we can cover here have already been debated by previous panels. We've already had lots of discussion of regulating AI out in the world. I think that's been really useful because I think we can see that as the different panels talked about that topic up until now, they were circling around a series of questions. And, um, and so let me walk through what some of those are. I think previous panels certainly circled around the question of whether existing legal structures, so anti-discrimination laws, consumer protection laws, products liability law, even whistleblower laws, which came up on a panel yesterday, whether those existing legal structures are up to the task of regulating AI, or whether we need entirely new structures of some sort. A second question is kind of the flip of the first, which is to what extent is it that existing laws might be the problem rather than the solution here, right? And so we've had a lot of talk of how trade secret laws or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act might actually be part of the problem here. And so the existing legal structure needs to be changed for that reason. Third question, if the answer is that we need something new, then is the best approach direct hard-edged regulation? Is it indirect regulation like algorithmic impact assessments? Is it soft self-regulation, industry-driven standards? Is it a mix of these? Is it something else entirely? And a final question that the past panels have been circling around a bit, is the ideal regulatory intervention centralized? We heard about the possibility of an FDA for AI yesterday, hmm. or is it actually decentralized and pluralistic? These are all classic regulatory questions that come up when we talk about the government role in any area, but especially in the AI area, an emergent area. And maybe we as a panel will be able to make some progress on some of those questions. If we can't, maybe we can add value on the other two government roles, right? The role of government in funding and research or uh, government use of AI itself. That's the first idea very quickly. The second idea it does feel like to me and maybe to the rest of you that we're at a hinge moment in terms of the government role in AI. Uh, there's plainly increasing interest among policymakers and among agency administrators. Uh, in the language of political science, you could say that maybe some policy windows are begin beginning to open up, if only just a, a crack. I think that's easiest to see at the federal level. You may not know this, but there are currently six bills wending their way through Congress. Uh, with various stylings like the Future of AI Act or the AI in Government Act. Mm -hmm. And these bills, they generally call for the formation of advisory committees and the like, right? They're not prescriptive or regulatory, but folks on the Hill tell me that something is gonna pass soon. And so that's a big step. It's also been an enormous amount of activity within the White House that I think Kay will be able to tell us about. There was a very big summit last spring and a report articulating various priorities for the federal government going forward. And then of course, there's a lot of activity beyond the federal government. There's the New York City Initiative that Brittany will surely tell us about. Uh, other cities like Seattle are forming committees to think about how we might regulate AI. And then moving beyond the water's edge to other countries, you of course have the GDPR. One last thing, I think an important idea follows from all of this, which is that many panelists on prior panels have remained quite agnostic about how exactly we should regulate AI. But my view is that it's actually time to get down to brass tacks and talk about regulatory instruments. Indeed, I would take it one step further and say that it's only through the lens of thinking about concrete regulatory approaches that we can actually talk in a useful way about some of the big values questions that I think have occupied so much of the conversation at this conference. So including how to maximize the social benefits of AI, efficiency, accuracy, maybe even equity, while minimizing its costs. Or further, how to ensure that the benefits and burdens of AI are fairly distributed across society. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna mostly get out of the way from here, but I hope that was useful as a way to, I don't know, pull together some of the different strands of the, of the conference up to now. All right, opening statements, and I think we'll just go down the line if that's, if that's okay. So we'll start with you, Eileen, and, and thank you for being here, and then shall I get your slides? Uh, no, you, uh, let me Not run. Not yet, okay, great. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. 
Uh, the last time I was in this room was uh, 41 years ago when I graduated from NYU Law mm -hmm. School. So I, I actually cannot believe that I'm here today talking about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, you've heard a couple of references to IEEE during the course of the last two days. IEEE actually stands for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and I think there are at least a few members in this room. Uh, it's a learned society that was sta started by Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison. And uh, its work right now is as a sponsor of peer-reviewed conferences around the world in technological, uh, scientific, engineering, and computer science fields and, and related arts and sciences. So on, uh, per year, we sponsor 1,600 peer-reviewed conferences, which means that on any given day, there will be at least three someplace in the world. Our membership is 430,000. It's composed of engineers, scientists, uh, some lawyers now, uh, and um, we're in 190 countries. Uh, the proceedings from all of our conferences are copyrighted and constitute uh, one third of the world's writings in the area of electrical engineering, electronics, and computer science. Uh, we have a digital library uh, for which there are subscriptions. And finally, and probably the most outward uh, looking part of the organization is our standards development organization. We have um, about 1,300 uh, standards that have been accepted around the world. We are probably best known for owning the standards for Wi-Fi and for um, uh, the Ethernet. We also work in the areas of, of um, cybersecurity, cloud computing, whatever is is new and important. Uh, and so in a US average income home, there will be at least 100 standards uh, that are being applied throughout uh, the home. So our breadth is, is really quite large. Our attitude toward uh, government regulation is uh, ecumenical. What we did, there, there was about four of us uh, about four years ago, who decided that the biggest issue in technology going forward would be the interface of artificial intelligence and ethics. And so what we did was we developed a, a um, broad, broadly based program at that time, first looking into our own house, and we changed the code of ethics for IEEE so that in design and engineering, members of IEEE have a professional responsibility to embed ethical concern in their autonomous designs. Um, if, if there is something that comes to light and they don't, uh, and uh, this has happened, uh, a review of their membership is made and they may be bounced out of IEEE. Uh, the, so first of all, we did that. The second thing we did was to start a worldwide conversation in which we uh, enlisted essentially high-end quality crowdsourcing in areas and issues of artificial intelligence. I should uh, tell you that the way in which we conceive of artificial intelligence is, is basically in four areas. It's machine learning, which is a, a phrase that many of you may know was coined in 1959, uh, which is your basic sorting, filing, uh, data processing. It has moved on, and I think this is what most panelists have been talking about during the course of the last two days, is artificial general intelligence, which is sequential learning, uh, repetition, and retention. Moving on, uh, we are start now starting to see, and this is where the area of concern has arisen, is artificial superintelligence, which 
is the capacity of a system or an algorithm to reprogram itself and to, to learn and move on beyond its initial designer. And finally, uh, and this is something that we're starting to just work on now, is extended intelligence. And uh, we're working in, in conjunction with the MIT Media Lab on machine assistance to ecosystems. And what this is for is to help to dispel dystopian fears and the concept of man versus artificial intelligence or uh, versus machine. In our reviews over the last two years, we set up a system of uh, versions of a document which is going to come to fruition uh, this coming year. And we asked a number of questions. Uh, and uh, what I've got on the screen now is the first two versions. No, you don't. Let me, let me do it for you. Okay. So, should, I, should I then steer your first slide? Yes. Okay. Great, that's sort of the front page of... Okay. I'm sorry, you can't see it. No, I can't. Uh, I want to go to the second page. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> uh, what you see on the screen now is a couple of versions of uh, ethically aligned design, which was a, a set of crowdsourced um, documentation that was put together uh, initially by about um, 300 scientists. We're now up to 1,000 scientists, uh, as well as philosophers, lawyers, uh, ethicists, anthropologists, religious leaders, who have put uh, their input on the issues that we have identified. There were candidates for recommendations to policymakers, educators, uh, and uh, individuals, as well as engineers who engage in design. If you want to take a look at it, I have the, uh, the uh, address that you can go to. Uh, and what we're doing now is finalizing what will be a treatise put out next year with recommendations and requests to governments and all the other constituents as to what they need to consider and think about uh, as uh, we move, move forward in this world. The second thing that we're um, doing is, this is working groups, inspiration for IEEE. Is it, is it the standards? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, the second thing we've done is um, the uh, development of standards working group. As I mentioned, our standards development is extremely robust. These are a different set of standards. You're probably all familiar with the 802 series, which is Wi-Fi. Uh, this is the 7000 series, and what we've done is we've moved beyond our usual standards which go to interoperability, compatibility, and functionality. And what we have superimposed on it is also normative issues. I've been listening the last two days to the issues that have been developed here uh, to make sure that in our breadth of review of standards that we have hit the main issues that have been identified here. And I think, I think we have. Uh, we've got, um, as you go down this list of 13, transparency, data privacy, algorithmic bias, data, 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 um, nudging, robotics, um, metrics for um, standards, trustworthiness of news sources, privacy terms, and a very detailed one on uh, automated facial recognition, which is becoming extremely important, uh, particularly in machines uh, and, and computers. Uh, as we go forward. The next thing that we've decided to do, and uh, this has just been launched um, a couple of months ago, is a certification program in which we will, once these standards are developed, uh, for either policies or methodologies or um, machines, uh, a certification program similar to the Good Housekeeping seal of approval will receive an IEEE approval with respect to 
the embedding of ethical concerns in the design uh, uh, and use of artificial intelligence. And finally, uh, we've looked at this from the education perspective because uh, young engineers coming up, and, and anyone who uses artificial intelligence uh, must be educated on the um, ethical uh, alignment and what particularly is happening as we use machines more and more. Uh, for example, one of the recommendations that we're going to be making is that there be a curricula in engineering schools uh, and any kind of scientific endeavors to embed a sense of empathy uh, as young engineers and young scientists uh, go into their careers. We've also uh, had the launch of several courses. One is online for corporations in the area of autonomous and um, uh, autonomous devices. And we are launching university courses and curricula and have a declaration that will be circulating next year for major prestigious universities around the world to align to uh, tell uh, uh, the world that they are embedding ethical considerations uh, within their artificial intelligence uh, curriculum. That's all. Great. Thank you, Eileen. <laughs> uh, Michael. Uh, thank you so much. And um, first of all, let me, let me say this is a topic that I, I not only see increasingly on the minds of policymakers, but it's increasingly on the minds of those who deal with policymakers and those in, um, in the business world. And I've looked at my career uh, at GE, at least, um, heading regulatory advocacy. Uh, and over the last seven years, it's been remarkable how much my work has pivoted towards digital policy issues and most of them are infused in one way or another with AI. So it is here, it is forcing everyone to pay attention and conferences like these are incredibly useful to help us learn and think through the implications. Um, I'm here to talk to, I think, broaden the context of what AI means. This uh, uh, conference has spent a lot of very appropriate time focusing on some of the applications of AI in the judicial context, um, in the governmental context on certain perhaps law enforcement applications and other things which raise very profound questions. Uh, but I think it's extremely important when we talk about AI and particularly AI in the policy context that we have the full view of what AI means, the full heterogeneity of AI applications because they raise different questions and they raise different equities and they demand different responses from policymakers. So I'm going to, in my initial presentation, take on the role of trying to tell you a little bit about the industrial internet of things and all the social promise um, with some externalities, but a good deal of social promise that's going to come from the application of AI through these technologies and which will require in some instances, in fact, the industries are often demanding government regulatory responses to allow the technologies to scale. In other instances, I think uh, the, the, the request, the, 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 the desire may be for a softer approach by government, but nevertheless, they, they, they implicate policy in different ways. Um, GE, as you know, makes lots of stuff. It's basically an uh, infrastructure uh, company. And everything I'm going to say has an application to GE because that's what I know. But please don't read this as a commercial for GE because there's lots of companies, large, medium, and small, doing exactly the same thing as GE is. So we are certainly not alone in this. But let me, let me walk you through some of the ways in which AI is making the world operate in ways that are, are faster, uh, smarter, safer, cheaper and more environmentally uh, sound. Um, I'm working right now with the Port of LA uh, and designing a port optimization software solution, which is allowing the largest port in the United States to harmonize the interactions between the shipping companies, the nine terminal operators, the two major freight lines, the 18,000 truckers, and the tens of thousands of chassis operators who move millions of containers in that port every year. Everything you buy, 40% of everything you buy comes to the port of LA, okay? It is, a, it is a, a, an engine for our economy. 
And there's also the largest point source for emissions in the South uh, Coast Basin. <laughs> so anything that can be done to prevent ships, trains, and trucks from idling and to be productive is good. And we have designed an AI-based software solution which allows all of these different modalities to orchestrate their operations more seamlessly. And in its initial phase, it increased throughput at the port by 10 to 12%. Um, that's going to reduce emissions. That's going to increase, increase economic productivity. Uh, in our view, that's a pretty good thing. And it's been adopted from labor to uh, management, if you will, uh, in all of these entities. Longshoremen are not easy sells, let me tell you. And they are on board on this, nor are truckers. Um, uh, another application for optimization of, of operations uh, are uh, the concept of digital twins. So we at GE are designing for almost any type of machine um, its virtual twin in the digital world. And we can then compare actual performance to optimal performance in the twin and then adjust the performance of the actual machine or run on the digital twin all sorts of operations that stress us through a variety of operational uh, extremes to look for predictive maintenance issues or malfunctions or breakdowns. Um, we can now take a wind farm of say 30 wind turbines and hone its performance in a way that increases efficiency by 20% by modulating how the various wind turbines are working amongst themselves and to adjust the cant of the turbines into the wind as it changes on a real-time basis. Again, um, that seems to have high social value in terms of maximizing output from a renewable energy source with relatively few externalities. There are some birds that get caught in the way, but that really seems a first order question of whether you have wind power or not. Um, drones. Drones are here. Drones are coming. And policymakers are busy at work trying to figure out how the hell we're going to have a whole bunch of drones flying around our farms, our towns, our cities doing a variety of tasks from package delivery to cellular capacity building to first response support um, and to infrastructure inspection. Um, we are designing, along with other companies, the unmanned traffic management systems that will allow all of these drones to operate in a safe way, to deconflict with each other, to follow the, the rules of the air, if you will. And I can assure you, all of that is AI based. Um, that there is impossible to imagine an autonomous operation of drones uh, in any ecosystem without the power of machine learning, without the power of AI. Um, and it's also now informing increasingly infrastructure inspection. Um, imagine a world, which is happening now, where instead of sending human beings uh, up refinery stacks or up a 300-foot wind turbine tower or um, climbing along transmission lines or inspecting 8 million scaffolds in the Manhattan area, instead you can fly a drone over those facilities more quickly, more cheaply, more efficaciously and inspect it. That's happening now and the learnings that come from all the sensors that are inspecting, whether it's infrared or LIDAR or ultrasound or 4K video, are in a machine learning context teaching themselves better ways to detect and predict corrosion or other anomalies. Mm. We're working with Shell Oil Company in the Permian Basin, West Texas, no people, lots of armadillos, and even more uh, oil drip wells to automate their well inspection process. Instead of sending guys out in pickup trucks who kill themselves at an alarming rate, it's shocking. We can now fly drones between well pads and look for methane, fugitive methane releases to look for road washouts and to inspect for corrosion. So again, there's a lot of promise there. In the medical area, um, Increasingly, AI is being used to support and improve patient care. Uh, GE just released, this sounds a little bit like a commercial, but it's just because I read about it yesterday, I'm very excited about it, uh, what's called the Edison platform. And that's going to help doctors and patients in a number of ways. First of all, it's going to use AI to create clear images through its CT scanning technology, which will actually lower the dosage that's necessary to do an efficacious uh, CT scan. That's good all around. It's going to allow for more immediate detection of lesions and other medical conditions, which oftentimes can have a huge impact on the success of patient uh, intervention and care. Uh, in MRI brain scanning, 
uh, it's going to use an algorithm to ID the blood vessels that are feeding tumors and then to plan an intervention with the doctor. And that's going to increase tumor response by 35 to 68 percent. And the procedure time is lowered by 11 percent. Again, I think there's a lot of social value um, in that. And let me finish with a discussion of its impact on manufacturing and the um, advent of additive manufacturing. Um, so AI is being used now increasingly in all types of manufacturing processes to optimize the manufacturing process, to optimize the supply chain, to predictively analyze when um, shutdowns or anomalies may occur in the process. And indeed, uh, a McKinsey study indicated um, that 80% of manufacturing companies expect to see positive effects and to implement AI initiatives in the years ahead. Um, one of the things that it's um, informing the most, which is very exciting, is additive manufacturing. So that's 3D printing, but on a large scale. Instead of subtractive manufacturing, where you take stuff and you grind it and lathe it and machine it down, okay, dangerous, wasteful, um, you can now build things from the bottom up one hair layer at a time using a variety of bonding techniques with lasers or other technologies. And AI informs that the whole way in two ways. First, it allows for esoteric new designs and architectures of, of devices or components that man either cannot think of because they haven't been trained because they're bound by the laws of both sort of physics and the uh, subtractive manufacturing process, right? Um, which can increase efficiency and efficacy. Um, but um, also, the machine can learn as it builds a part. It can analyze what is happening to the part in real time and adjust the manufacturing process in real time to look for embedded defects or to ensure integrity to the part. So as a result, uh, what you're seeing now is, for instance, in a jet engine, the consolidation of 855 parts in our new turboprop engine to 12 parts. That improves emissions, efficiency, and safety because the most dangerous piece or uh, you know, uh, uh, the most dangerous area in any mechanical uh, device is where it's welded, bolted, soldered, uh, attached, right? And when you can take 855 pieces in a jet engine, reduce them to 12 titanium, um, components, you have increased safety. So I'm going to stop there. I was a little survey of the world of AI in the industrial Internet of Things context. 50 billion devices or machines by 2030 that are going to be connected. That's going to actually dwarf the consumer device world. And policymakers need to think carefully about the context of the AI applications there when they are making broader policies about AI. More on that when we get into the discussion. Great, thank you, Michael. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Kei Koizumi. So I'm with American Association for the Advancement of Science. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we were also co-founded by Thomas Edison. So uh, yeah. um, back in the 19th century. He got around. And he did. he also has its roots. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's for sure. Um, we are. Um, we publish you know, artificial intelligence articles in our journals, including the journal Science, but um, we are the world's largest general scientific society. And we've long had a, a presence in science policy. So the interface of science, the world of science and engineering and public policy. Um, and as part of that, I guess, on my career trajectory, um, I was, uh, for eight years, I was at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where during the Obama administration, and that is, of course, when the topics of artificial intelligence really came to the surface and um, were prominent enough that it even got the attention of people well inside the beltway. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about science policy and the science and engineering contributions to understanding our public policy options for artificial intelligence. So um, first of all, you know, in science policy, the, the one and one enduring and universally accepted role for the government has been to support fundamental research uh, that companies will not support, and also research that supports government or societal missions. So those are the, the three pillars on which the government has built its support of research in general, and also for AI research. 
So by a, um, the exact amount is classified uh, because so much of the investment is classified. But uh, in the past two years alone, um, generally, uh, but roughly 40% increase in the government's support of AI research has taken place. It is well over a billion dollars a year. And much, much of it is going to be the foundation for tomorrow's discoveries of the kind that the GE is, or, is already making. And much of it is being supported in universities, government laboratories, and in companies. Uh, so with that burgeoning investment in mind, uh, periodically the federal agencies, of which there are a dozen supporting artificial intelligence, get together and figure out, well, what, where is this investment going? So in 2016, uh, the federal science agencies investing in artificial intelligence put together an R&D strategic plan for AI. And that is now currently being updated uh, because even two years later, that uh, strategic plan is already looking a little bit out of date in that advances have moved so fast that federal agencies need to get together again and update in 2019 this strategic plan to guide this multi-billion dollar federal investment. So uh, AAAS has been involved in that process because you know, our members are many of the scientists who are involved in government-supported AI research. And at the time, we were, at, we at AAAS were concerned that uh, the federal government is moving forward on one key part of the AI strategic plan, but not the others. The one key part that the federal government is moving forward on is in making long-term investments in AI research. So I wasn't able to be here yesterday because I was at the National Science Foundation on our peer review panel. The NSF is one of those agencies making these long-term investments in AI research. So there are a lot of proposals coming in from scientists and engineers on tomorrow or the next decade's uh, advances in AI. But what has been missing so far and what the strategic plan identified is that the government also needs to be making supportive AI research investments in, for example, understanding the legal, ethical, and societal implications of AI. Because at the time in 2016, and still now, we don't have the knowledge base necessarily to intelligently regulate uh, and make policy for AI, for government uses and also for societal uses. Um, we identified that need, and that is going to involve a lot of research uh, from my community of the social sciences. Uh, but so far, that research has not really taken off in, to the extent that basic research in AI, AI has. So that remains a concern for AAAS and other societies. Another key feature of uh, this strategic plan in 2016 was that it called for a national AI R&D workforce study and strategy. Because this it's the government's responsibility to ensure that you know, the American people have the education, the training, and opportunities needed to meet the jobs of today and also the jobs of tomorrow. But at the time in 2016, we had no real idea for policymaking purposes of what the AI research workforce looks like, much less the AI development workforce and the AI-enabled workforce. The AI-enabled workforce is probably, the, of course, the largest one because that's pretty much everyone. All of, all of our industries will be touched by, by AI. But without understanding the, the human dimension of the workforce opportunities, we aren't able to make intelligent po policies to do that. Um, you know, two and a half years later, we find that you know, still that workforce study has not been taking place. Um, so, Organizations like AAAS, we've been trying to cobble together the employment data, labor projections data, and you know that's been unsatisfactory. Uh, we still don't know what the needs are. And we are very happy, of course, that IEEE, AAAS, and other non-governmental organizations are putting together ethics training cur curricula for AI workers. But without knowing exactly what the needs are, what industries they're likely to be going to, it's going to be uh, an incomplete exercise. So there's opportunity for us to do a lot more. And one particular attempt, 
area where we wanted to pay attention to is that the future AI workforce needs to look very different from the current AI workforce. I mean, it is going to be a national shame and tragedy if tomorrow's AI workforce looks like today's workforce. If it, you know, uh, we need the AI workforce of tomorrow to look different from, well, this room, for example, um, and in, in so many ways. Uh, and, and there is, of course, a role for government and for all of our institutions to play a part in making that possible, to make the opportunities uh, for uh, participating in AI industries and AI-enabled industries accessible to everyone in, in our uh, population. I think I will stop at that pillar, that first pillar of government-supported research for, for AI research, and then go on to talk about some of the other pillars later. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany. So hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, David. Um, again, my name is Brittany Saunders. I am uh, Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Um, the New York City Commission on Human Rights, uh, as David mentioned, is a local city agency. Um, our responsibility is to enforce and to educate New Yorkers about their rights and their obligations under the city human rights law, uh, which, as you may know, is our uh, very broad, very protective um, anti-discrimination law at the local level. Um, we have jurisdiction, our major areas of jurisdiction are over employment, um, housing, and public accommodations. We also have protections in the areas of bias-based profiling by law enforcement and something called discriminatory harassment, which is roughly akin to a civil version of um, a hate crime. Um, and the commission also has just a little bit of a sense of structure. We have a law enforcement bureau that's staffed by attorneys who take and investigate complaints but from the public. Uh, and we also have a community relations bureau, um, and those are folks who educate New Yorkers about their rights. And then finally, um, we have a lot of other units, but kind of in terms of outward facing work, we have a, um, the office of the chair, which is where I work. And we're really the kind of policy unit in the agency. Um, and so that is why I'm here with you today, because part of our responsibility is to think about, kind of look forward, look at what's coming down the pipeline and see um, where the agency sh should um, be engaging and how. Um, and so I'll say, uh, one, that I am so pleased to be here today, because I think that the questions of, um, of equity and inclusion, um, discrimination, bias um, that we work on at the commission are certainly central um, to our ability to function as a democratic society. I think the great lesson of American history is that um, though you know, racism, sexism, other forms of oppression have always really functioned and continue to function uh, to kind of undermine our ability to be a really truly effective um, and inclusive democracy. Um, thinking about um, our work on um, artificial intelligence, it really kind of flows from the fact that you know, our jurisdiction is in these areas of decision making. And in recent years, I'd say starting around 2016, um, and actually prior to my own arrival at the commission, um, uh, a number of folks started thinking about the ways in which um, new companies were being created or existing companies were starting to deploy algorithms in their decision making in areas like employment and housing and public accommodations and others. Um, and we wanted to kind of get a sense of you know, the degree to which folks were considering our law as they were um, developing out those applications, um, the types of data that folks were using, and then also ultimately what is the right way for the commission to be engaging around these issues. Uh, so we've really engaged in a process of uh, consultation. I mean, to, to Kay's point, like there is um, a lot that we think we need to understand, both about the technology itself, but also about um, the folks who are building the technology and the processes that they're using um, to build these applications. Um, and so we have kind of slowly but surely built um, kind of an informal uh, group of folks who are attorneys, um, who are uh, data scientists, computer scientists, who have really been helping us over the last couple of years to think through um, how uh, the commission should be engaging around these issues. Um, so kind of related to that work and alongside that work more recently, um, the city has established a task force called the Automated Decision Systems Task Force um, that I am co-chair of. Um, and that task force was established in, um, let's see, it's legislation that passed in late 2017, um, went into effect in early 2018, and really requires the uh, task force uh, convened by the mayor over the course of the subsequent 18 months to develop a set of recommendations um, around the use and um, the use of, of automated decision systems and we can say algorithms for the purpose of this conversation, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence kind of uh, 
various applications in uh, those universes um, to government work. Um, and I will say we're very early in that process. That's also the subject of my keynote, so I'm not going to drill down too deep right now. Um, but I will say that uh, based on the experience of, um, of the commission, I think we, we both see kind of the promise and the challenges here. So um, we have seen, for example, how the use of algorithms can kind of aid and support our work. For example, we partnered with um, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics um, to kind of do some investigation around source of income discrimination. So under our city's um, human rights law, uh, in the housing space, um, you sh are not to be discriminated against on the basis of your use of a housing subsidy um, to pay for your rent. Um, and so we worked with the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics to identify, you know, where are those neighborhoods that you would think would be um, kind of ripe for people's use of vouchers? So neighborhoods where rents are affordable but, and schools are good and there's low crime and they'd be really attractive to individuals who are looking for a place to live, um, but where voucher usage is, is low. Um, and so we were able to identify, I think, about two dozen neighborhoods that were then um, uh, places that the commission could look to in terms of focusing kind of its investigative resources. So I think that's certainly um, on the positive side towards some of the points that we made before. You know, there, there is certainly, I think, rich potential um, to kind of drive data-driven deci uh, decision-making in government, to drive uh, stronger um, application and enforcement of, you know, anti-discrimination laws like ours. Um, but, you know, certainly also um, that a need to keep a focus on um, these questions of discrimination uh, and bias as well, that I'm sure have been part of the conversation earlier. Bill, right. there. All right, so we will need to move relatively briskly from here <laughs> if oh my God. we are going to touch on the three government roles that I highlighted uh, at the start. But let's start with the first one, and I really do want to press you on that brass tax question that I uh, that I you know noted at, at the outset. Um, and I think the key here is to, to think in the areas that you know best, right, within the policy silo that you know best, right? How would you answer that question that I asked at the outset, which is? Are existing legal structures up to the task? Are we going to need new ones? And if the answer is new ones, what are they? Is it direct? Is it indirect? Is it soft industry-driven standards? Is it something else entirely? I would love to have at least a brief conversation about um, about that issue. Anyone can start. Jump so in. Let me. Um, I'll jump in as someone who's spent a lot of time in the regulatory world over my career. Just and just say a, a few things. First of all, um, I think that a lot of the discussion in terms of policy approaches is going to need to draw differentiations between um, AI applications that are really B2B and industrial in their focus and those that involve personal PII and are consumer facing. I think it's not a perfect distinction, but I think it's an informative one. Second, I think in a lot of areas, especially those outside of the PII context and maybe even in there, I think some humility and regulatory caution is appropriate at this stage. It doesn't mean there's not um, hawk-like observation and monitoring mm -hmm. and capacity building in government, but I think we are we should be careful in our own human predictive abilities mm -hmm. on how we are going to predict what the externalities are, what the market failures are, what the costs and benefits will be to these technologies, and so there should be some there should not be, in my sense, a rush to regulate. There should be a lot of pay attention paying to the space by, by regulators. Um, I think it's going to be very context driven. There's different algorithms, there's different data sets, and there's different use cases. And I think policies need to be tailored to that heterogeneous world. There's a role for voluntary standard setting that is important and those can be adopted by regulators later. I think there's a role for contract-driven relationships between sophisticated parties, um, between GE and their customers, for instance, to solve a lot of these problems. Um, and there's a huge role for R&D. Let me finish with just some areas of specific brass tax intervention that the government's already involved in or will be shortly. First is, as I said, unmanned aircraft systems. Everybody in the commercial drone space understands that the only way the industry will get the social license to operate and to scale and thrive is if there are, is regulation. And so industry is proactively working with regulators to get regulations on the books. It's almost like, please regulate and why aren't you doing it faster, okay? Um, I think they are well equipped to do this from a safety standpoint. I'm not sure they're well equipped to do it in an 
to prevent innovation, um, uh, um, the sort of uh, depression. Um, but but it is it is happening, and it's really a partnership um, between the regulators and and the industry with safety as the as the baseline. Additive manufacturing, we have to get regulators to agree to certificate parts that are additively manufactured because the regulatory regime contemplates them being manufactured in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. So there's trust building, information delivery, and gradually regulators at the FDA, the FAA are understanding that it's not necessarily different. It can even be better if it's additively manufactured. Um, and finally, the Commerce Department just issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking um, uh, earlier this week. Um, very significant. I would encourage you to go on regulations.gov and take a look at it from BIS, um, which is asking for comments from the public on a series of export controls on emerging technologies and how the government decides to select which emerging technologies are covered for export control and what the controls will be um, and what the national security interest actually is that motivates it is going to have a big impact on innovation and the growth of a lot of these industries. And, and I can assure you that a lot of AI-based um, technologies are included in the mix. So that's going to be a long rulemaking process, but I think it's going to be a very, very significant policy making. I mean, Thank you for I, that. I think yeah. um, there's a fundamental question that uh, we haven't addressed yet um, as a society, and that is uh, whether or not we want to come to the conclusion that just because something can be created and designed, should we do it? And I think that's the basis of um, uh, innovation, creation, and also regulation. I don't think we've come to that uh, at this point. I'm not sure how we do, but um, that has to be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I was going to say thank you because that, I, I urge you, AAAS is going to comment on that rulemaking mm -hmm. uh, and because our members will be involved. Scientists and engineers in the United States will have, will have their work affected by any potential regulations. And, you know, start, Moving off of what I started with, as I said, I don't think we understand enough about the ethical, legal, social, and economic implications of AI to fully have the knowledge base to be able to effectively regulate as a government. So I agree that I urge caution. At the same time, I think in the cases that we've seen so far, the existing tools that federal agencies have seem to be working pretty well. I mean, and the cases that you brought up in, in terms of um, you know, drones and also driverless cars. I mean, the ex extending the current regulations that we have on driver cars uh, and toy airplanes uh, that are remote controlled, those for the moment seem to be holding up well in being able to regulate this new class of, of vehicles. We don't know how long, we don't know how, if that's going to hold up for the other areas in which government is going to be called upon to regulate the use of AI. So that is, of course, what I worry about um, because our existing tools may run out in the near future. And I think the short answer to the question is it depends. I mean, is the, is the government equipped to do this? I think it depends. Um, and I do worry that in some areas, for example, in, the, in um, drones and driverless cars, while safety is well, well regulated, we have the tools to that, for, in areas like cybersecurity, we don't have the, the right tools or the right knowledge either. Because of course, with every introduction of driverless cars, there are dangers about getting hacked. And that actually applies to driver cars as well, because you've seen the videos of, of a car with a driver being taken over by a remote actor. That can certainly happen for drones and for driver and for cars without drivers or with drivers. So in that, I think we are going to have to develop new tools to be able to, to um, regulate intelligently. Um, and I just worry that we're not gonna be get there in time, either with the knowledge base or the tool building. I would just say that I think um, kind of along those lines that there is, 
it's certainly helpful, I think, for folks as a baseline to have a rich understanding of what the current state of the law is. And I think there's actually a lot of room for information sharing and education, both between um, folks who are in government and might know a lot and have a lot to share about like uh, current law and what its obligations are and what, um, what rights it, pr it provides, but also to another kind of um, in the other direction, right, to have inf uh, information sharing and education from folks who are innovating in this space about how they're approaching it and how they're thinking about these questions. Um, and also, I guess, uh, to Michael's points, like some of the risks, right, um, around stepping in too early. I think um, I also uh, would echo the point around hawkish monitoring, because I think um, from our from our perspective, it's like the this space is developing so quickly. Um, and while I think we recognize that there is like a, a ton for us to learn and a ton for us to understand. There's also um, that sense of urgency in trying to make sure that as things are developing and are, you know, kind of moving into the marketplace and going to use that we're making sure that we're protecting the rights that um, folks are supposed to enjoy. Another thing that's um, a difficulty with regard to regulation is that uh, innovation, the use of artificial intelligence, even the production companies uh, such as GE are not jurisdictionally based. Uh, they're multinational. And so consequently, it seems to me that what we ought to be looking at is a higher order of regulation, whether that be uh, through the, a region uh, such as the EU, through the United Nations, through some other global uh, set of organizations, particularly because the use of artificial intelligence at its core uh, depends upon um, interoperability and compatibility among devices. And if you're not using the same types of regulations, it's, it's going to be difficult. Great. So let me, let me leap ahead to the third government role that I highlighted <laughs> in, my, in my introductory remarks, which is government use of AI. We have, we have three panelists who served or serve <laughs> in government, someone else who's clearly thought lots about it. Um, you know, I can tell you that there's quite a bit of government uptake of AI and machine learning tools. So federal agencies as diverse as the Social Security Administration, the EPA, the SEC have uh, AI and ML tools in place doing real regulatory work. Um, and uh, you could also point to the whole smart cities movement, which is presumably something that Brittany uh, has, has grappled with a bit in, in her work. So government uptake of these tools is, is very real. Um, and so I'd love to hear some, some, some conversation about that, but I actually wanna ask a, a broader question and just invite some thoughts from the panelists, which is how will the AI uh, revolution, call it, how will it change government itself? Slowly. Um, <laughs> I, well, I, I say that because, well, from ordinary people's experiences with government, let's face it, when you're dealing with Social Security Administration, et cetera, um, sometimes you're not even sure if they have IT, you know, the basic web access, et cetera, much less AI. Uh, at the same time, so I think at the same time, we know that those systems are being put into place behind the scenes, be, beyond the customer facing uh, parts of, of the, the federal government. Uh, and so I, I worry that, of course, it's the resource rich federal agencies that will be using ML AI techniques first and the re most resource ri rich agencies, the Department of Defense, $700 billion a year. Um, they will be the original users of many of yes, and they in fact, in fact they are. It's not will be, they are. Um, and maybe next is the seventy billion dollar Department of Homeland Security. Um, so the civilian agencies will be lagging behind. That causes some worry. Um, and uh, I'm encouraged that of course now the federal agencies are getting together in you know series of interlocking working groups to figure out how uh, they can deploy AI technologies to serve uh, the people better and to accomplish government missions. And for the moment, I think that those uses, because they are, are rolling out slowly, will be, more on the, will be more on the continuum of you know, government agencies being to use information technologies, web services, et cetera. And then next they'll get to AI-enabled services. Uh, but 
In the meantime, the Defense and Homeland Security agencies will be rolling on ahead. I mean, I'll just say very briefly that I think that's right. I think it will be slow. I mean, um, uh, you know, one of my responsibilities at the commission is that I oversee or um, I oversee some of our operations, including IT. And I will say that, that while we've come a long way in recent years in terms of investing in that, it was still quite a long way from doing some of the more sophisticated um, um, things that others might do. But I will also say that, like, there's, an, you know, part of the way that it will change government is that it will force, I think, um, uh, kind of more, and I think this is already happening, so it will force, like, education and reflection and thinking internally around how to deploy these technologies about mm. their impact and just kind of very basic generation um, education in general. So um, we also serve on something called the Internet Health and Human Rights Group, um, working group within um, the city, which is just really a space for folks to learn about some of these issues and to really build their own internal knowledge. And I think, you know, that is something we can do that's relatively um, or less resource intensive, but important and certainly an initial step. So uh, I don't. I just. I, I agree with everything that has been said. And, and when I look at the use of, of AI in government, I, I start with the idea that sadly in our society today we have a trust deficit with government. Um, and I think it's there for a variety of legitimate and a variety of illegitimate uh, and sort of rhetorically created reasons. But it is real. And so I think government has to be very, very careful about how they deploy AI and how they contextualize and communicate the deployment of AI for, for no other reason than self-preservation and legitimacy. That's the first point. Uh, the second one is that I think it's useful uh, as, a, as a tool to look at the deployment of AI in government as sort of a ascending ladder of uses to become more complex and more difficult. At one level, it's very easy to see how AI can be extremely useful to state, uh, local, and federal governments in terms of maximizing scarce resources, the allocation of assets and resources in a, in a smart way, right? And I think that's real, you know, there could be injections of bias and other issues into that, but I think let's work through that together because the social benefits of maximizing the value of scarce government resources, I think, is, is huge and real. You can see in terms of government operations how it could be useful. The automated inspection idea that I talked about, it's amazing how many state and local governments are genuinely interested in how they can use drones, crawlers, and subsea re re remote robotics to actually inspect public infrastructure because it's cheap and better and safer, okay? So that makes sense in the public context. Or um, you can see how you might use AI to perfect and improve um, a, a permitting process, right? Or some kind of basic um, a permitting or adjudicatory function of government that doesn't go to sort of core liberty issues and which has a right of appeal and transparency and notification that AI is being used. Once you go above that, you start getting into some gnarly, that's a term of our areas, I think, where you're talking about do you have AI-informed regulatory decisions, right? Do you have AI-informed judicial decisions? And people are talking about that. There is literature in reputable law review articles. Um, it's possible one of the moderators in this panel may be looking into this issue um, about whether and how how can you do that? Should you do that? And I think that is in the future. Um, and, and I think that is where the questions become most difficult. Anytime you're substituting human subjective, ethically and morally based decisions or implicating civil liberties is where uh, the most caution is in order. Mm. I think it depends on what uh, branch of, in, here in the United States, what branch of government you're looking at. Uh, everything that's been said really went to essentially the executive branch. If you look at the legislative branch, and if you, any of you watched the uh, Mark Zuckerberg hearings before Congress, um, the two days of testimony, it was painfully clear that the uh, legislators were not educated in the area. And I think as uh, there is a turnover uh, in uh, members of Congress, as a younger, uh, more 
technologically sophisticated group of legislators come on stream, which is happening. There have been very young people who have been uh, elected recently. Uh, I think that will change, and I think it's probably going to change within the, in the next year or two. David, can I, can I just very quickly sure. reaffirm and echo that I completely agree. I think one of the challenges government faces is capacity building and sophistication about AI. Uh, in all levels of government. Um, I, I think the, those hearings illustrated a, a, a dearth of, of, of sophistication and capacity in the area. And it exists in the, in the executive branch too. There are really dedicated, smart regulators who understand their lane because it's what they've done for 40 years. But when they're presented with something with an AI component, they really don't understand the implications of that. And it's hard to create good policy around it. So I think government owes all of us as taxpayers <laughs> and we uh, the duty of in building capacity and we owe them the duty of helping them get there in a trusted and transparent way. I'm going to say amen to that and say that it's not just AI, but it's the broad spectrum of science and technology issues because executive, legislative and judicial branch uh, officials are equally in the dark about AI and genetic editing technologies, information technologies, climate science, uh, biology, physics, etc. Great. I will break in there and mm -hmm. note that yep. we have just enough time for a few questions, if there are some. So, um, sure. Are we going to do the microphone thing? Um, maybe that that might be best so that everyone can hear uh, the questions. So, why don't we start right over here since you're already in position? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I had a question. I'm really interested in regulation that addresses some of the harmful psychological man manipulation campaigns that are going on um, on technological platforms. And one real issue here that I've heard from a lot of professors that I've been working with is just data access. So it's really hard. I mean, Facebook is, for example, sitting on a whole treasure trove of data that researchers can't really access. Um, beyond that, often universities aren't supposed to run ads that might be construed as political campaigns, so it's hard for us to test things that the Russian government might have an easier time testing on social media platforms. So I was curious to know about any promising solutions or ideas that you guys have heard in terms of in improving data access for researchers so that we can figure out how to mitigate some of these political risks. Because a lot of federal laws right now, I think the last Stanford report actually mentioned this on AI, um, are ambiguous about whether people can also even try to reverse engineer a lot of proprietary AI systems in order to get at what's really going on. Hmm. I mean, that's, that speaks to me because you know, many of my friends and colleagues in the social sciences are dealing with the same problem. Um, and the state of the art right now is individual access. You have to go to Facebook or to Twitter, sign your non-disclosure disagreements, and you know, find the data enclave, et cetera. And um, so that is a, I mean, to the social science community, that is an unsatisfactory way to go, but it's the way it is right now. Um, of course, so I'm grateful to the, my colleagues who have tried, grabbed the Facebook data uh, the Twitter data, et cetera, and you know, been able to make you know, meaningful research projects out of them. But we're going to need to do more of that if we're going to understand um, the impact of social media because you were, I mean, that is probably the, the number one uh, use of AI technologies that you know, affects us on a daily, sometimes you know, you know, 12 times daily basis when we check social media. Oh. Just a, a quick thought. Um, I think the FANG companies are entering a new era of um, engagement with government. Um, I, I just think uh, without necessarily um, taking sides, I, I think it's clear that the externalities of systems that have grown dramatically in 10 years and are both full of social value but now are clearly have um, uh, negative externalities associated with them in some way is becoming clear and governments all around the world, including in the U.S., are going to start to look towards intervention. And I think the challenge for these companies um, and for all of us is going to be how do you 
So how, how do they successfully navigate a new relationship with government? Mm -hmm. And how do they do it in the way that actually continues to promote and provide all the valuable um, uh, resources of their platforms, their services, their technologies, but does so in a way that adequately protects public interests? And to date, you know, I, I think the tech world, Silicon Valley, has been relatively um, untouched by government policy. And in many ways, it's allowed them to achieve the scales they have. But I think now society's kind of reevaluating re given this, the scope and scale of the company. Okay, yeah. Thank you for the question. Should, yeah. should we try to get one, one or two more in? Yeah. Hi, thank you channel. all for the yeah, great discussion. And you guys touched on a lot of topics that have been sort of percolating in my mind since yesterday as well. So AI is a very broad term, right? It, yeah. it ranges from technology that deals with target advertising all the way to self-driving cars. And for each of these issues, different, each of these things have different issues from data collection to how the data is used, what kind of algorithms you're training on them. And you have obviously have different perspectives that we've heard in the past, you know, yesterday and today. For example, you know, from Kathy O'Neill's perspective on how the data itself is being used to train algorithms that yield biased results mm -hmm. to you know, more prevalent issues and like socioeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. I, and you guys touched on that a little bit that it's the legislators at the end of it who are drafting laws and who are passing these bills. And there are six, you said, you, David, you mentioned there's six bills right now that are going on in the House. My question is who is educating these legislators? Who, who bears the responsibility of making sure they're getting to hear all these different perspectives? Because obviously, it's, it's a self selecting group. Uh, an organization, a broad organization, might not want to raise certain issues because they might not want regulations on those issues. So, who do you think bears the responsibility and how do we go about educating the legislators who will be writing and passing these laws that at the end of it, we'll, we're the ones who are going to have to interpret and apply? I think the short answer is we all do. We all have that responsibility because as you heard, they don't have that dedicated capacity. So do not count on you know, a member of Congress being able to call the Office of Technology Assessment, which no longer exists, mm -hmm. to, get the, to get advice about science technology issues. So it's up to all of us. And I know it's particularly up to my community, the science and engineering community, and which is one reason that AAAS for the past several years has been trying to expand its capacity to advise all sorts of decision makers on science technology issues. But it's not just for AAA, it's not just for IAAA or GE. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we ought to do together because it's a big problem and um, we can't solve it unless we all participate in some way. And if you take a look at, if you take a look at those AI bills, they are not, um, mm, I, I mean, <laughs> they're basically, we don't know what to do, so uh, the aid, establish a commission. You know, establishing commission does not actually do anything. And probably considering the state of knowledge, that members of Congress have, that's a good thing. It's better to do nothing and ask other people to do it than to try to legislate policy uh, on AI. Uh, can we sneak in one more question? Okay, great, one more, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, one of the main points where I've been hearing about is even though we are capable of using this high technology, whether we should use it. So I think my question is, like the recent gene editing breakthrough on curing HIV babies has brought the classic controversy between like uh, what are the benefits brought by the intelligence system and uh, the, it's, uh, the challenge it brought to the um, uh, bioethic principles. So in your opinion, uh, in which way should policymakers act as mediator of this controversy and how the government should draw a line between the encouraging scientific exploration and risking people's lives with uncertain side effects? Can you state the controversy again? I, I think I missed it right at the beginning. Yeah, so basically, uh, I think the controversy should be like uh, whether we should explore the benefits brought by the intelligence system and, uh, uh, and it's challenging to the bioethical principles. Well, you know, um, I was like banging my head on the floor because that, that is the issue of the week for the, the science community in that um, uh, well, Chinese scientist claims to have um, engineered uh, the engineered the genes of embryos and two babies twins were born with genetic engineering to make them resistant to the HIV virus um, so 
the, the short answer and how it applies to artificial intelligence is uh, at least in the United States, when the prospect of genetically engineered babies who could pass on the genetically engineered traits to their children, et cetera, was first you know, surfaced, became a possibility. Then the scientific community and the government policymaking community, members of Congress, executive branch agencies, state agencies, universities got together and attempted to draw up ethical guidelines for the responsible use of, in this case, genetically engineered technologies. Um, and so that is kind of the default, the, the formula that we use to do that. And in the United States case, I think it's worked. Although there are very few national laws that govern genetic editing, there are a set of you know, almost universally accepted ethical codes of conduct, codes and standards and guidelines that define you know, what is worth doing or what is ethical to do in the research space and the application space. I think we are going to have to get to several more of these types of conferences and, and, and group uh, policy making processes as applications of AI expand. Um, so I'm, I'm ready for it. I, I, I just, but it's going to, in this political environment, it's going to take a pretty egregious case of, you know, a, an AI technology causing some, you know, pretty significant and public harm for you know, such a process to come together. And that's a little bit of what I'm afraid of. Um, okay, one more response briefly from Eileen. Um, what you have described is exactly what we're trying to address through IEEE. And the parallel outside of the genetics area for artificial intelligence is what you see playing out. There is a code among uh, professional uh, geneticists that has been violated after that happened. The, there uh, was publicity on that. There was also here in the United States an investigation to see if any American scientists were involved in it uh, by their university. So I think you'll see that as we build the infrastructure around um, uh, artificial intelligence. All right, uh, please join me in thanking our terrific panelists.